story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, king size, extra mild and soothing, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. An unidentified man is abducted from a downtown street. The scene is checked where the man was reported taken. Bloodstains are found on the sidewalk. The abductors escaped in a gray sedan. No one saw the license number. Your job? Get him. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Yes, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 18th. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. It was 6.48 p.m. when we got to the corner of 11th and South Pierce Street, the 797 Club. Sorry, no more service tonight, closing up. Your name Leon Morley? Yeah, I can't serve you any drinks, so closing up. Police officers, Mr. Morley. I'd like to talk to you a minute, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought maybe you were after a drink. We were just talking to the officers in the radio car up the street, the car that answered the call out here tonight. They told us you're one of the people who saw what happened. Well, yeah, I guess I did. I saw part of it anyway. Lousy deal kind of thing makes your ulcers pop. That's why I'm closing down early, going home. We're following through in the investigation, Mr. Morley. I'd like to have you tell us everything you know about it, if you would, everything that you saw. I told the cops in the radio car everything I know. It was about 6 o'clock, and I heard this big commotion out in the street. I didn't know what it was. It sounded like somebody was hurt. I went out and took a look. Marie in the beauty shop next door, she was outside rubbernecking, too. She saw as much as I did. You talked to her? Yes, sir, we have. She wasn't too clear on some of the details. Maybe you can straighten it out for us. I'm glad to if I can. What do you want to know? You mind telling us in your own words just exactly how it happened? I mean, how you saw it? Well, there's not an awful lot to it. I was working behind the bar here, and it was around 6 o'clock, like I say, maybe a couple of minutes after. I was just fixing up a round of drinks for some fellas when I heard this noise outside. Yeah. Didn't know what it was at first. Sounded like somebody screaming like they were hurt. You said you heard this commotion outside the bar about 6 o'clock. Yeah, that's right. Well, I didn't go out right then. I finished mixing the round of drinks. First, I thought the racket was just a couple of early drunks, but it kept on. Man screaming. It got louder, and I decided to take a look. Mm-hmm. I went out and looked down the street a couple of doors, down toward the corner. Which corner is that, Mr. Morley? Well, the nearest one, down to the left. Here, I'll show you. All right, fine. I didn't know what was happening. It was a terrible sound. A man screaming at the top of his lungs. You recognize who the man was? No, I didn't. Never saw him before. Didn't get too good a look at him anyway. It was getting kind of dark. Here, let me show you. Over here by the window. Okay, fine. I see it was right down there, just next to that mailbox. Mm-hmm. Well, these two guys had a hold of the man who was screaming. They were trying to drag him into a car, a gray sedan. The man was trying to fight him off. Can you describe any of these three men for us? No, I couldn't be sure about it. Like I say, it was getting kind of dark. Well, you can see for yourself, they were about 75 or 100 feet away. Mm-hmm. This man they were trying to drag into the car, he kept screaming, leave me alone, you can have the money, leave me alone, you can have my car. Looked like he was hurt to me, blood on his clothes. Didn't anybody try to help him? Well, you know how this neighborhood is. When there's trouble, they all cut out. They don't want to get involved. It happened pretty fast anyway. These two guys got this man in the back seat of the car, and the big guy got in the back seat with him. The smaller guy got in the front seat, and they took off. Now, which way did they go, Mr. Morley? Uh, straight down the street there. They turned right at that corner. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to see the license number? No, I thought of it, though. They didn't turn the car lights on. and went by pretty fast, too. I couldn't get a good look at it. Was it a California plate, do you know? Oh, yeah, I noticed that much. That's about all, though. What kind of a car was it? Like I told you, a gray sedan, four-door. I couldn't tell the make. Fairly new car. Well, did you notice anything outstanding about the car, anything at all? Well, I don't know. What do you mean, outstanding? Well, special markings of any kind, anything unusual, maybe some of the accessories, spotlight, anything like that? 
No, nothing I noticed. The rear bumper was bent out, I think. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure of it. Rear bumper? Yeah. I saw it when they drove off. Uh, they drove right past the place here. Well, how about the men, sir? Can you describe them at all? No. One was pretty tall and thin. The other one was smaller. About the same build on the thin side. They sure must have worked that guy over. He was all bent over. Looked like he was holding his stomach. Stains all down the front of his suit. On the sidewalk, too. I guess you saw that. Yes, sir, we did. Now, you're sure that you've never seen any of these men before? Nothing familiar about them at all? No, sir, not to me. I think if I saw them before, I'd know it. Oh, just a minute. It's probably the wife. Excuse me. I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. What do you think, Joe? Well, it doesn't look too good. Stains on the sidewalk down there. If it was just a robbery, why'd they take the guy with him? Uh, got me. Possibly might have recognized him. Well, maybe you got some, but I hope you're wrong. If he can make the hoods, good chance you're not going to turn the man loose alive. Uh, Sergeant. Yeah. Uh, it's your office on the phone. I want to talk to either one of you. Oh, I'll get it, Joe. Right, thanks, Frank. Phone straight back, Sergeant. End of the bar. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Look, Sergeant, I got to have something to quiet my nerves. How about you? You want a drink? Yeah. No, no, thanks. Besides the woman in that beauty shop next door, Mr. Morley, did you notice anyone else around who no, saw what went on? Sir. No, as far as I know, Marie and I were the only ones. Uh, Just like I told you, when there's any trouble maybe. around this neighborhood, they get off the street quick. You can't think of anything else that might okay. give us a break on this? Anything at all now? Yeah, Wish right. I could. I think I told you just about everything. Right. Sure okay. feel lousy. Joe. Yeah. Just talking to Harry. Yeah. 1A1 found the car, gray sedan. Where'd they find it? Third and Bixel, it was empty. Key's still in it. Are you sure it's the right car? Blood stains in the back seat. 7.18 p.m. Frank and I left the 797 Club, got in the car, and drove down to 3rd and Bexel, where the abandoned gray sedan had been located. It matched the same general description of the abductor's car, a four-door gray sedan, late model, with a damaged rear bumper. Dean Bergman from Leighton Prince dusted the car and succeeded in raising a half a dozen fingerprints, which he took back to the office for possible identification. The crime lab crew went over the car for additional physical evidence. The stains found on the back seat were identified as having been made by human blood. The white slip attached to the steering post showed the car was registered to a Kenneth L. Gorman at a Canal Street address. Before Frank and I left the scene, we got a report that approximately 20 minutes prior to the time the gray sedan had been located, another car had been stolen. It was a maroon, late model club coupe, licensed 7Tom 7972. It had been taken in the same neighborhood, less than two blocks from where the gray sedan was abandoned. A broadcast and an APB was gotten out on it immediately. 8.05 p.m. After checking by the office, Frank and I drove down to check on the home address of the registered owner of the gray sedan, Kenneth L. Gorman. It was a white wood frame cottage at the upper end of Canal Street. The woman who answered the door identified herself as Mrs. Elsie Gorman, a small middle-aged woman, blue eyes, partially graying hair. No, I'm sorry, officers. My husband isn't home right now. Where is he, Mrs. Gorman? Do you know? Well, he went downtown to see a friend of his business appointment. Is it anything I can help you with? Are you expecting your husband home pretty soon, ma'am? Well, yes, I am. Matter of fact, he should have been home long before this. I don't know what's keeping him. Told me he was going downtown to collect some money a friend of his owed him. Said he'd be right back. I don't know what could be keeping him. When do you leave the house, ma'am? About 2.30, 3 o'clock this afternoon. It's almost 8.30 now. It could be he stopped to have a beer with his friend. He usually phones, though, if he's going to be late. I don't understand these men sometimes. You and your husband own a car, Mrs. Gorman? Yes, we do. <clears throat> My husband has it right now. Why? What kind of a car is it, ma'am? A 49 Chevy sedan. Gray color, four-door? Yes. License number 7T7972? Well, yes, I think that's it. Why? What's the matter? Something happened? Nothing to get worried about, Mrs. Gorman. We located the car in the downtown area parked on a side street. The keys were still in it. Thought we'd check on it. Where was it parked? Near 3rd and Bixel. Well, that can't be right. This man my husband was going to see has his store on Alameda. It's on Alameda between 9th and 10th. No reason for Kenneth to drive the car way down on 3rd Street. Well, possibly he might have had another business appointment down there, ma'am. Maybe something he didn't mention to you. Well, I don't know. I suppose it is possible. You'd think he'd call, though. He usually does when he's going to be out late like this. What about this man your husband was going to see, Miss Gorman? You happen to know who he is? Yes, Fred Bernard. He's in the sheet metal business, has his shop on South Alameda. He owed my husband $300. My husband went down this afternoon to collect it. He a friend of your husband's, is he? Oh, yes, they're good friends. Fred and my husband have done business for years. There wasn't any ill feeling between them about this debt? No, no, of course not. It was just a bill for some materials. Why do you ask that? Just routine questions, ma'am. Can you think of anyone at all who might have a quarrel with your husband? Somebody who has a grudge against him, maybe? No. Why are you asking questions like that? Is there something wrong? Something you're not telling me about? No, ma'am. It's just a routine check, Miss Gorman. Nothing to worry about. I want to make sure everything's all right, that's all. The way you talk, it isn't all right. It's far from right. 
Ken, it's never gone this long without calling me. There must be something wrong. No use getting yourself all worked up, ma'am. You admit your husband might have had another appointment after he left Bernard. By the way, have you checked with Mr. Bernard yet, ma'am? No, to tell you the truth, I haven't. I don't usually like to call my husband when he's out on business. I don't like to bother him. This is different, though. I, I think I'll call Fred Bernard right now. It's a good idea. Do you mind if we wait, ma'am? No, no, not at all. It'll only take me a minute. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. What do you think? Well, I don't know. Doesn't look too good, does it? Car's abandoned, stains in the back seat. Man's late in getting home. It's all there. Mm -hmm. Could be anything, couldn't it? Doesn't look good. Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. I just talked to Fred Bernard. He said my husband's been there and left. What time did he leave Bernard's, ma'am? About 3.15, 3.30. Fred Bernard paid my husband the $300 he owed him, and my husband left. Fred told me my husband asked him if he wouldn't have a glass of beer with him, but Fred said no, he was busy. Uh -huh. So my husband said, all right, he was going to have a beer at home. Told Fred he was going right home. That was at 3.15 this afternoon. Yes, ma'am. There must be something wrong, I know it. It just isn't like my husband. He wouldn't leave the car like that. If he was late, at least he'd call me. Oh, would you excuse me again? I've had the dinner on the stove and boiled away to nothing. I want to turn it off. Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. I hope it works out all right. Seems like a nice woman. Yes, she does. Sure doesn't figure, does it? He's had plenty of time to get home. No reason why he shouldn't be here by this time. Well, I can think of two. Yeah? An empty car and $300. We continued interviewing the wife of the missing man, Kenneth Gorman, and she told us that occasionally he did some drinking at neighborhood bars. She also told us that when her husband drank quite a bit in public places, he was over-friendly and he liked to brag and flash money. Mrs. Gorman got on the phone, contacted all their friends and relatives who happened to be home, but none of them had seen or heard from Mr. Gorman that day. Before Frank and I left, Mrs. Gorman gave us a complete description of her husband, the clothing he was wearing, and also a recent photograph of him. We called Fred Bernard, the friend of the missing man, the last known person to see him, and told him that we'd like to talk to him. He told us that he was working late, getting out a rush order, and that we could find him in his shop. 9.05 p.m., we located Bernard at his shop on South Alameda. Won't take long, will it? An awful rush tonight. Won't take long, sir. Did Mr. Gorman give you any idea where he was going when he left here this afternoon? No, just like I told his wife on the phone. I paid him the money I owed him. He asked me if I wanted a beer, took a rain check on it, and he left. Went right out that door there. You seem worried about anything, Mr. Gorman? No, not that I could see. He seemed all right to me. Had he been drinking, do you know? No, couldn't say. If he was, I couldn't smell it on him. Is there anything unusual about him at all? Anything out of the ordinary? No, same old Ken. Pretty good mood when I paid him. $300 cash. He's all dressed up. I guess you might call that unusual. How do you mean, unusual? Well, Ken's like me. Working man, not much of a dresser. Usually find him in working clothes. I think it's the second time I ever saw him in a suit. A new one, too. Looked nice on him. He didn't give you any indication at all where he might be going, did he? No, he just collected his money and went out. I thought maybe he was going home. Uh, what did Miss Gorman tell you? Didn't you have any idea where he is? No, sir. She told us he came down here to collect some money. She expected him right home. We're not trying to be nosy, Mr. Bernard, but how do Gorman and his wife get along? They're pretty happy together? Mm, yes, I guess you might say that. Get along as well as you could expect them to. What do you mean by that? Mm, nothing. Ken's a, well, he's a fellow who likes his nightlife. Wife's just the opposite, quiet type. Almost left him once. Guess they're getting along pretty good now, though. Why'd she almost leave him? Would you happen to know? Well, she found him out with a girlfriend. Matter of fact, she caught him at a terrible row. Didn't understand any of it. The girlfriend wasn't much at all, real lush. You know the girl's name? Yeah, I met her twice. Name's Elaine something. Hey, she works at a cafe three blocks from here. Real lush. She sure took me. You know if Gorman's been seeing her lately? Well, he says he hasn't been. I don't know. I never can tell when he's drinking, though. Didn't his wife mention the girl at all? No, no I guess she wouldn't. It's been a terrible thing for her when she found out. Terrible. How long ago was all this, Mr. Bernard? I mean, this affair Gorman had with this girl. Oh, six weeks, maybe two months ago, just about that. I tell you, it was the queerest thing I ever saw. Ken has a nice, quiet wife of his at home, and they get along fine together, never fought, never quarreled. Then he picks up with his girly lane, sure different. How's that? A real mean girl. Two of them fought all the time. 9.40 p.m. We left Fred Bernard at his shop, drove to the restaurant where Gorman's girlfriend reportedly was working as a waitress, and we checked with the manager. He told us a girl by the name of Elaine Summerall had been employed there, but that she'd been fired for drinking on the job. He also told us that he had reason to suspect that Elaine Summerall was not the girl's true name. We showed the cafe manager a picture of Mr. Gorman, and he identified it. He said Gorman had been in that afternoon inquiring about the Summerall girl. Gorman had asked for the girl's forwarding address, but the manager told us that he'd thrown it away. We left our card with him and asked him to contact us immediately in the event the girl returned. 10.18 p.m. We drove back to the city hall and checked in at the office. 
We ran the name and description of the Summerall girl through R&I, and they told us they had a Summerall girl in the files who answered the description. Elaine Summerall, alias Elaine O'Donnell, alias Elaine Shellman. There were wants out on her for forgery, three counts, and grand theft merchandise. We signed out of the office, went across the street to the Federal Cafe, and had a sandwich and a cup of coffee. It wouldn't look so rough if it wasn't for the stains they found in the back seat of that car. It's hard to get around. It points to more in robbery, doesn't it? Yeah, Mo sure strikes me pretty yeah. funny, pulling the man off the street like that. Must be either hard up or crazy, huh? Federal Cafe. Just a minute. Friday? Yeah. Phone. Right, thank you. I'll be right back, Frank. Okay. Yeah, Friday talking. Yeah, Glenn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, where? How long ago? Yeah, I see, uh-huh. It wasn't, huh? Yeah, we'll roll on it right now. Tell them we're on our way in, will you? Yeah, right, thanks, Glenn, bye. Yeah? Chandler, they just found the maroon coupe, the one stolen in the neighborhood where Gorman's was dropped. Where'd they find it? Picked it off going up through Lancaster, sheriff's deputies. Does it look good on our job? Well, there were two men in the car. One of them had a knife, blood stains on their clothes all over the inside of the car. How does it figure? It doesn't. Not a scratch on either one of them. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Friends, because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma... More smokers coast to coast are switching to king-size Fatimas every day. Yes, more smokers coast to coast are finding that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Now here's the practical way to prove Fatima quality yourself. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Remember, more and more of your friends are switching to king-size Fatimas. Compare them yourself. King-size Fatima, extra mild and soothing plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Look for the bright, sunny yellow pack. Buy king-size Fatima. Monday, March 18th, 10.40 p.m. After we received the report that the stolen maroon coupe, along with the two suspects, had been recovered north of the city in the town of Lancaster, Frank and I stopped by the record bureau and checked to see if there was a make on either one of the suspects. The first one, Paul Mike, white male American, 32 years, 5 foot 11, 150 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. He had a long felony record, including burglary and robbery. He'd served sentences in both San Quentin and Folsom, and there was a want on him for violation of parole. The second suspect, Floyd Compton, white male American, 34 years, 5 foot 8, 135 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. His record included arrests on suspicion of burglary, four grand theft merchandise, and three drunk arrests. He was a petty thief known to us as a shoplifter. He'd never served time in a penitentiary. 10.55 p.m., Frank and I, with identifying photographs of the two suspects, left the city and drove north. We checked in at the Lancaster Sheriff's Office substation. Captain Walker Hannon briefed us on the details of the arrest, and then he showed us back to the cell block where the two suspects were being held. He told us neither of the men had been questioned because the officers there weren't acquainted with the facts of the case. He also informed us both men had been separated from the time of their apprehension. Captain Hannon had Paul Mike taken from his cell, and he was brought to the captain's office where we started to question him. It went slow. I don't think I understand you, Sergeant. What's all the excitement about? You can answer that better than we can, Mike. Answer what? What do you want to know? The car, Mike, and the blood stains. What about them? A little unusual, wouldn't you say? I don't know anything about any blood stains. If they're in the car, I don't know how they got there. It isn't my car. Yeah, we know that. What about the stains in your clothes? Well, I don't know. We were sitting in the car there. Maybe the stains rubbed off on us. You got a cigarette? Only one thing wrong with that story, Mike. The stains are on the wrong side of you. All right, so I had a fight. Got hit in the nose. What's that, a law against it? I got a hunch, Mike. Yeah? You're lying. Where'd you get that car? I told you where I got it. Me and Compton were bumming a ride on San Fernando Road. This spook came along in the maroon coupe and gave us a ride. A couple of miles this side of Lancaster, he stopped the car and got out. Said he'd be right back. Walked right out into the desert. That right? Yeah. Waited for him to come back. Waited a long time. Honked the horn, yelled for him. We finally gave it up. Matter of fact, Compton and me got a little scared. Thought maybe the car was stolen. 
I didn't want to get caught in a hot car. I'm an ex-con. I couldn't stand the heat. It's the truth. I'm squaring with you. What about the money, Mike? Huh? The money. They booked you in with $133 in your pocket. Oh, yeah. I got lucky in a crap game last night. I was pulling out. How about the pocket knife? Blood stains on it? You win that in a crap game, too? No, matter of fact, it was in the car. Found it right there on the seat. Big coincidence, Mike. Somebody leaves you a car, blood stains on the inside, stains on you and your partner. Pocket knife stains on that, too. You're on parole, leaving town without notice, driving a car you're not supposed to be driving. Pocket full of money you got no way of accounting for. Face it, Mike. What do you mean? Face it, you're dead. Flag on your card now. Parole officer wants you. Now, how about the truth? What do you mean, the truth? I've told it to you. Now, come on. Let's save time for all of us, Mike. You've been around long enough. You've graduated. You know we're not going to buy that line. What line? How can I explain things to you? You won't believe me. I told you nothing but the truth since I walked into this room, and you won't believe me. You got a cigarette? How do you account for the blood in your shirt? I told you I had a fight. Guy hit me in the nose. Happened right down there in L.A. You can check it. Where did it happen? Bar, downtown. There's a lot of bars downtown. Uh, Place on South Pierce. I go there sometimes. What's the name of it? 797 Club. Ask anybody in there. You said it happened tonight? Yeah, about 8 o'clock. Just before we cut out. Guy hit me right on the nose. Real rough one. You got a cigarette? What time did you say you had that fight? About 8 o'clock. You sure of that? Sure, why? You're not doing too well, Mike. Now what's the matter? We were at the 797 Club tonight. We talked to the owner. So what? We were there at 635. He locked the place up and went home at 645. He was sick. 797 Club? Yeah, that's right. Now, where were you at the time of the robbery? I want an attorney. I'm not saying anything else. Trying to frame me. Take me back to myself. Any way you want it, Mike. Let's go. What's the use? Tell them the truth and they don't believe you. How about that cigarette? Captain, would you have the jailer return this one and bring in Captain? How about that? He couldn't tell the truth if it helped him. Hope we do better with his partner. Well, we're going to have to. We know we're on the right track. The big question is, what have they done with Gorman? Big guess. A thousand places they could have dumped him between here and L.A. Well, I hate to make book on his chances. Everything points to a killing, doesn't it? Mike looks like the one who could handle it. Come on in, Tom. And over here. Sit down. Yeah. My name's Friday. This is Smith, my partner. Hi. Branched out of your class, haven't you, Compton? Running in the big time here? What do you mean? We haven't done anything. Robbery, kidnapping, grand theft auto. You're moving pretty fast. Didn't Mike tell you? This guy gave us a ride. He stopped the car and walked away. We didn't steal the car. Thought the guy was lost. We drove in here to get help. Let's take it from the top. Where'd you spend the day? Who were you with? Mike. He stayed overnight with me. Both slept till about 2 o'clock, got something to eat, and went to his show. Got out about 5. What'd you do then? I went to this bar downtown. Didn't Mike tell you? You were with him, weren't you? Sure, I was with him. He'll tell you that. He did. And you didn't do anything wrong, did you? No. Then what are you worrying about? Let's forget Mike now. You level with us, will you? You're getting it straight. I didn't do anything. Mike says he can't stand another beef. Can't afford it. He's too up right now. I know that. We believe him, Compton. Mike's done too much time. He couldn't make another trip easy. We think he's telling us the truth. Well, so am I. What are you getting at, anyway? All right, now, let's get on the bandwagon while you can. We don't need you, Compton. If you talk or not, it doesn't make any difference. Just a minute. Can I talk to Mike? All right, we'll give it a try. Frank, you want to ask him? Yeah, okay. Be right back. Now, let's pick up where we left off. The blood stains on your clothes, stains inside the car. Where'd they come from? Mike told you, didn't he? Yeah, you tell us. What for? Why can't I wait till Mike gets here? All right. What about the money? You want to explain about that? Nothing to explain. I saved it. What kind of work do you do? Odd jobs around town, any place I can find them. You say you got up at 2, you had something to eat, you went to a show, and you got out about 5 o'clock. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. When'd you go to the 797 Club? Right after the show, about 5 o'clock. How long did you stay there? About an hour, till about 6 o'clock. Anything unusual happen while you're in the bar? What do you mean? Anything unusual, anything out of the ordinary. Oh, Mike and me sat there, talked, had some drinks. Pretty dead place. Decided to take off for Reno. Mike's got a friend up there, good friend. Thought maybe he'd get the both of us jobs. Captain? Yeah? Where's Mike? I told him you wanted to talk to him. He said he didn't want to see you. They took him out to feed him. Told me to tell you he'd see you in court. What do you mean, see me in court? I think you got it, Captain. We told you we didn't need you. Come on, we're tired. I'm going to lock you up. What'd he say? What'd he tell you? Now, look, fella, we're tired. You wanted to go the hard way. All right, you'll get the answers in court. Well, what'd he say? What'd he tell you? Come on, let's go. You should have known better. Mike's not going to ride your beef for you. He was in it all the way. It's his idea and it's his beef, not mine. I argued with him. I know he shouldn't have gone along crazy. Yeah, come on. It's the truth. The whole thing's Mike's. It's his knife, too. Met the guy in some bar and he was real high, talking about some dame he was looking for, a girlfriend. Guy bought us a couple of drinks, had a big roll of bills. Mike framed the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, he wanted to roll the guy. We left, got in the guy's car and drove with him way toward town. Mike was driving. I didn't know where he was heading for. All of a sudden, the guy says he wants another drink. Mike didn't want to stop, but he was making a racket. Finally pulled up by the 797 Club. We got out. Then the guy changes his mind. He wants to go home. Mike tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. Mike pulled a knife and cut him. Then he slugged the guy, and the two of us pushed him in the car and took off. Where'd you go from there? 
We cruised around till we found another car, Maroon Coupe. We clouded that one, dumped the gray sedan, and took off up this way. Not right. Look, it's the truth. I'll even tell you about the guy. What happened to him? You got flashlights in your car? The man still alive? I don't know. He was when we left him. 1.45 a.m. The Lancaster Sheriff substation contacted the local emergency ambulance, and they were instructed to follow our car. Along with the suspect, Floyd Compton, Frank and I got in the car and headed south following his directions. After several tries at locating the spot where Mike and Compton supposedly left their victim, we finally found where they'd parked their car on the side of the road. We got out and Compton led us back across a stretch of sand to a thick clump of sagebrush about 300 yards off the highway. The victim, Kenneth Gorman, was lying face down. His hands and feet were tied together. It was fairly evident that he'd lost a good deal of blood and that he was in a state of severe shock. He was placed on a stretcher and placed in the ambulance. All right, Compton, that's it. Let's go. Be real tough. I'm sure glad he ain't dead. Yeah, sure. Come on. Where are we going now? Back to the sheriff's office. Want to take your statement. Okay with me. Just one thing I want. One more thing. Yeah? That lousy Mike. I want to be there. I want to see him. How's that? Trying to load this thing on me. I want to see his face when you tell him. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, neither can we. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 12th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 84, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, once again, I'd like to ask you to compare Fatima with the king-size cigarette you're now smoking. When you do, I'm convinced that you'll agree that king-size Fatimas do give you more for your money. An extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Remember, Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack and remember, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Paul Mike and his accomplice, Floyd Compton, were filed on for violation of Section 209 of the Penal Code, kidnapping for the purpose of robbery, and Section 211 of the Penal Code, robbery in the first degree. They were also filed on for one count of grand theft auto. They were tried and convicted and received sentences as prescribed by law. Kidnapping for the purpose of robbery, where bodily harm is inflicted, is punishable by the death sentence or life imprisonment without possibility of parole. Robbery is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. Grand theft auto is punishable by a prison term of not less than one, nor more than ten years. The victim, Kenneth Gorman, finally recovered after more than three months in the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, next week, Dragnet presents a trilogy three documented case histories of vital importance to all of us. This trio of authentic stories is both tragic and terrifying. Please try to hear Dragnet next week when we present our trilogy. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Vic Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Sam Edwards. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now read Dragnet every day on the comic page of your favorite newspaper. Please consult your local daily paper. King Size Fatima has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Adventure is yours tonight with Counter Spy on NBC.